see or coming up. We have Bible study this week on Thursday and a Justice in Action recap sort of meeting right beforehand. So you would come to that if you're involved in Bible study or Justice in Action. Also um, next Sunday we will do Sunday school that I planned today and I hope some people can come because it's about the farm bill. There's a short video or so. It's like 20 minutes long, and I just couldn't fit it in the jam and everything today. But Kathy has a wonderful plan for us to learn about the farm bill and how we can be of service to getting things done that will help people. So please come to Sunday school next week. As you saw on the screen, we're still doing the Poverty Impact Network and the Senior Bulletin, I think, hygiene drive and we're going to make that until June 11th we decided and service Sunday school will be that day so next week is the last day of regular Sunday school we're changing um, service Sunday school to June 11th when more people can be here so you have an extra week actually to bring in items for Poverty Impact Network who are starting to rent our facilities in the annex starting next week as well so it's great to partner with them and um, the garage sale, June 17th. I don't know if you want to say something, Jay, or do you want me to? June 17th. Go ahead. We could use at the sale. Bring anything, and you can keep it in the garage, the annex, or you can bring it that day. It's up to you. Are there any other announcements I am missing? Let us prepare. Oh, let me say happy birthday to a few people and um, anniversary because Brian and Nancy have an anniversary this week. Happy anniversary to them. And then um, Lindsay, Marilyn, and Jaylene are coming up in the month of May as well. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. We have a um, special prelude today with the praise book.
praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. I apologize, I didn't get to call the worship in the PowerPoint. <laughs> Good morning. Please stand as we do the call to worship. A voice cried out, prepare the way for God's arrival. Make the road straight and smooth, a highway fit for our God. Fill in the valleys, level off the hills. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for forerunners who have prepared the way throughout history. John the Baptist prepared the people for the Messiah's coming. Others have prepared the way for us in this time and place. We are grateful for those you sent to shine a light on the path we are in today. May we also be able to leave a path for those who choose to follow and believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We now let us sing Family of God and then greet one another in Christian love. <laughs>
first of all, um, still an announcement. After church, we have uh, a little reception for Haley, graduating with her Doctor of Musical Arts. Is that correct? Is that how it's said? And Savannah, graduating with her Master's in Music. I mean, we are so fortunate that we have these high qualified, talented people who have been part of our church. So please join us for that. And then another thing, today is actually Teacher Recognition Day. Now, I had three people to recognize, and the only one of them is here, was able to be here today. <laughs> it's just the way it works. You know, summer is coming. Um, I'm recognizing also Andrea and Kathy, but they're not here, so I will just give a little token of our appreciation to Sue, and she'll have to open it later and look in it. But my message to Sue and all the teachers is that, first of all, we appreciate all that you do for us, your faithful service, having lessons for us, and inspiring us to um, have a closer calling with God. But um, what I said to them was that you are the spice when, t or you add spice when teaching the sweet word of God. So <laughs> she'll have to let you in on that one. For our children's story today, um, you know, as I brought up a roll of paper towel, I was going to go with toilet paper, and I thought maybe paper towel was a little bit more appropriate in the church sanctuary. And we're going to just have to uh, suspend our imagination here, our belief, and pretend that this is something else. Um, have you ever been to a wedding and you're waiting, you know, just before the bride comes down? What do they sometimes do at some weddings? Do you know? Have you ever seen? Yeah, and, I, and I'm not going to waste this good paper towel from the kitchen for that, but somebody goes through and they roll down this beautiful runner that goes down the aisle, right? And what is the purpose of that? And it goes all the way down the aisle. What's the point of doing this at a wedding? Anybody know? Just a custom? I guess it just kind of, it, it shows the way for the bride to walk, right? As if she couldn't figure out, okay, there's the aisle, the punch, it's probably I need to go that way. But, and it also, but it prepares her way for her wedding ceremony, doesn't it? And it keeps her beautiful dress clean as she comes down the aisle. So anyway, so just pretend that. Um, another thing, um, okay, if you're a kid, you probably don't watch the, the Academy Awards, but for those adults here, what do they sometimes say? You know, what do the stars walk on as they walk in to the Academy Awards? Yes, it's the red carpet. Again, it's, it's, it's a special place, except I think this year they said it was black, the red carpet. But again, it kind of points the way that the stars are supposed to walk and uh, on their way into the building. So uh, these are ways that maybe we can kind of have a path prepared for us. If we're hiking uh, in the woods or something, we know we're really happy when somebody has prepared a path before us, right? So we know where to hike through um, on our hike through the woods rather than just stomping through the underbrush. But um, a person can be a someone also who can lead the way before us. And in today's scriptures, we find that a long, long, uh, thousands of years ago, there was a prophet named Isaiah and he said that somebody was going to come and he was going to prepare the way in the wilderness, out of the wilderness. And um, we don't know, and Isaiah didn't mention who that person is, but then we find out in today's scripture, Mark first chapter one through eight, that it was somebody named John the Baptist. And so John the Baptist came and he was kind of an interesting character. He wore strange clothes, he ate strange stuff, he liked to hang out in the wilderness, out in the deserts, in the desert. But what he did is that he, oh, he ate locusts. Do you know what locusts are? They're like bugs, yeah, right. Anyway, but um, what he said was, 
He said, get ready, change your ways, then you will be forgiven all your sins. He was getting their way ready for somebody too. It says, many people heard about John and his message and came to be baptized by him. They came from the city of Jerusalem, they came from the small towns and the villages, and they came from all over Judea. And John baptized them in the water of the Jordan River. That's really pretty cool, isn't it? And John told everyone, there's somebody else coming who is much more powerful than I'm going to be, than I am. I'm not even good enough to tie his sandals. All I can do is baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And the people really didn't know what he was talking about. But John the Baptist was preparing the way for the coming of somebody else. Anybody know who that might have been? Maybe Jesus? <laughs> yeah. So he prepared the way for us. He didn't roll out a carpet or anything, but he prepared for the way for somebody else to come to us. And, of course, we know that Jesus then came and also prepared the way for us then to have a closer walk with his Father in heaven with God. And there are other people, too. Can you think of other people who help prepare the way for us as we're growing up to maybe have a closer call with God, with Jesus? Who might be some people? Yeah. Our parents help prepare the way. Our Sunday school teachers help prepare the way. You know, back when we used to have lots and lots of kids, and for all of us, I can remember, you know, I can still remember one very memorable Sunday school story that I had from when I was a little kid, when I was probably just beginning to understand Germ or English, and it just made an impression on me. But these were all people that helped prepare the way to help us have a closer walk with God. So we thank God today for our teachers and for all the other people in our lives who helped prepare the way. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Well, I would like Karen to give us an update about STEM. So I pray. Jim was not feeling well this morning, and uh, he decided that he would go to the emergency room. I asked him if I could go with him, and he said, no. I said, are you sure? And he said, no, you don't need to come. So anyway, he's been dealing with some issues, the added issues this last week, and so he's uncomfortable and he needs some answers to, you know, what's going on. So I would appreciate all the prayers from everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any worries or concerns? Um, Shelly also was in the emergency room <coughs> last night, and again, this was the second time this week, um, her respiratory virus or whatever became, you know, pneumonia or some kind of bronchial, so it's pretty serious, and they're doing tests. She hasn't let me know uh, how those tests came out, but the doctor told her not to come today, so we pray that she rests and recovers well. Brian is still recovering from his back surgery and also got a in respiratory <laughs> infection. Nick's happy is feeling better. Anyone else ill? I know Kay has been struggling with her tooth surgery that has been so hard, but we are grateful that this phase is over, and we pray for her complete healing and that now the rest will be easier. <laughs> Anyone else? Let us bow our heads. Lord, we lift up Shelly, Brian, Jim. Help them in their recovery. Help Jim's doctors to figure out what is best, Lord. How to ease his discomfort and pain. Provide as much healing as possible. We thank you for the celebrations today for Savannah and Haley, for your work in their lives so far. May you continue to walk with them. Thank you for new people being here today, including Celine, for all those that are able to be here and all those that are not. We ask you to hold them in your hands, Lord, to help guide us as we walk along. 
Now I will say the serenity prayer as it relates to change by Reinhold Niebuhr. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen. I also would like you to pray for Sean. Um, he's taking his journeyman's test this afternoon, and I'm sure he would appreciate all the prayers he could get. Also, Kathy and Al are traveling. There are other people traveling. So um, Sam is just got back from Australia, I know. I, he's not with us, but I know he got back late yes, yesterday. So we're glad that he's home safe. Now we will have a praise band song, Holy Spirit.
Today's good news comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. In the New Revised Standard Version, this section is entitled, Proclamation of John the Baptist. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean region and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Ziggy, Savannah, Becca, all the people working hard for the church service to run well, Charlie, Doug. Change is coming. Get ready. That's what John the Baptist is saying. Something I found when I was researching for children's messages was how when we play hide and seek, when kids play hide and seek, the fun really isn't in hiding. No one wants to sit there and not be found sitting all alone in the dark, right? The fun is in getting found. Whether you're playing tag or you, know, you run to the base or not, the fun is when you get found. So change that when you're re waiting, when you say, get ready, that's what they say, right? When you get the person, that's it. Get ready or not, here I come. And that's sort of what John the Baptist is saying with Jesus, and that's what Jesus is saying. So that's what we're going to be unpacking today. First of all, as you entered, you received your seat. Um, hopefully, if you did not, you can raise your hand and Charlie will bring you one, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, and, and I hope we had enough. I do have some more printing I'll put in people's mailboxes. This is really for the whole Gospel of Mark that we're starting today. On one side, there's a blueprint, and on the other, a breakdown. This is the blueprint. This is the breakdown. I hope they'll be useful and interesting for you to look over and perhaps use as we embark on our journey <coughs> through this action-packed Gospel of Mark for about a year's time. But I disagree with one of the things on the sheet, both of these sheets, really. When it says this, the dates that this covers, they both say it covers from 7 B.C. to 26 A.D. And I won't get into details, but if this were the case, we would certainly hear about Jesus' birth, because it was after that first date. But Mark begins when Jesus is about to begin his ministry which would mean it covers from about 26 to 30 A.D. So if you'd like, you could cross it off. But the plan so far is to get through the first column on the breakdown up until the near the end of Chapter 9, by the, end of, by the end of the year or before we take a break for Advent. I bought the Believer's Bible Commentary on this Gospel, so I can use it as we move through. It's written by Timothy Gethard, which he authored in 2001. I like to use this Anabaptist series when I can, and now I'm up to owning four of these. I have a lot to go, but I'm glad to own this one now. First, let's do a little puzzle solving. In verse 2, it says, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. This quote actually puts together two quotes from the Old Testament. Malachi 3.1, which says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come. And Isaiah 43 says, A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make sm smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Now ancient writers often mix together quotations from two sources when they were sure that their audiences knew them both. And this is what Mark is doing purposefully. He's not confusing them, but putting them together for a reason. 
Well, we do this sometimes when we piece together passages from different Gospels to gain a more complete picture of what occurred. And we can do that this here with the scene of John baptizing people. We know from John 1, 19 to 28, that John was baptizing at Bethany on the east bank of the River Jordan when authorities came to question him and he tells them that he's not the Messiah. So this is not just any wilderness area. This location is of great significance to the Jews coming to, be, to hear John and be baptized. It's about five miles east of Jericho and is regarded to be the spot that Elijah crossed the river before he was taken to heaven, found in 2 Kings 2. And this reference would remind Jews of Malachi 4, 6, that says Elijah will return to turn the hearts of people, which is referred to in John as being John in Luke 1, the forerunner of Jesus, calling for repentant hearts and pointing to the coming Messiah. We can glean more about John the Baptist from Luke 1 as well. In verse 36, we are told this is his cousin, Jesus' cousin, about six months older than him. Elizabeth was from the tribe of Levi and Mary from Judah, who were both brothers to the 12 sons of Jacob. So this would make them third cousins, I suppose, in our day. We can also use Luke 3 to see more of the scene portrayed in this passage, which gives a time period this occurred. And I won't go get into it much, but it puts it right around 26 AD, what I told you earlier. And it tells us specifically that John is indeed Elizabeth and Zechariah's son. And it says he went out all in the, to the country around the Jordan, preaching again a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Again, reminding them of the Malachi passage. And this is what they were expecting, for Elijah to return and basically do what John is doing. And this, in John 1, the religious leaders are sent to ask him if he, in fact, is Elijah, and he says no. Then Luke 3 also quotes from Isaiah 40 more extensively, adding that all people will see God's salvation. And then in Matthew 3, like in Matthew 3, Luke goes a little bit further than Mark in telling of John's teaching by adding, don't consider yourself saved just because you're a son of Abraham. You should produce fruit with your repentance. And Luke is specific in this teaching. When asked what they should do, John says, if you have two shirts, you should share with one who has none. And if you have food, you should share it as well. He then tells tax collectors to not collect more than what is required and tells soldiers to not extort money or accuse people falsely, but to be content with their pay. And it says the people were thinking he may be the Messiah. And a verse found in all the Gospels, also found in our passage today, with John saying, I baptize you with water, but one that is more powerful, who I am not worthy to untie his sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. For Timothy Getter, John's baptism is just preparatory, just until Jesus arrives. And though there's a lot of contention found in the interpretation of this verse, as some people argue that it's saying baptism is when the Holy Spirit enters you, and without it, that would be impossible. Yet an Anabaptist theology would say it's an outward sign of an inward work, that it's not the saving grace, in other words, always available to one who surrenders to God. It's more about one's proclamation publicly to that surrender and walk with God. And this seemed more of a covenant to walk in community with the ch those in the church. Gettard says that R. Gundry states that the spirit baptism John is referring to is not a Pentecostal type when Jesus would give people the spirit, but says that John is saying what Jesus will be doing from then on 
acting in the power of the Spirit on behalf of others. John Piper describes this well in an interview on Desiring God. He says, in a few places in the Bible, this phrase of the Holy Spirit filling and entering, like in Luke, here, and in Acts, is used for the disciples who were already believers. And what it means fully is that they will get power from the Spirit for Christ-exalting ministry. Piper says this that we need this type of filling and empowering over and over again. It may begin a conversion, which may be before, during, or after an actual baptism, but it keeps going on and we keep needing it. He quotes Martin Lloyd-Jones, who declared, Lord, I need a filling of all the time, a fresh filling. I need a fresh baptism, a fresh anointing, an outpouring pouring of the Spirit continually. Lastly, Luke 3, 18 says, With many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. So we can piece this scene together with little nuances from each gospel, which brings me back to the beginning of Mark, which doesn't start with Jesus' genealogy or his birth, the first verse says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. The NLT words it this way. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And in the message by Eugene Peterson, it says, the good news of Jesus Christ, the message, begins here. He calls what we would call the gospel, the message, which may be pretty accurate, accurate actually, the Believer's Church Bible Commentary says Mark's gospel is more than a historical report of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's a proclamation of good news, an interpretation of Jesus and his message. It's a challenge to faithful discipleships and a theological and literary masterpiece. It's a challenge to faithful discipleship as well. Even though it seems to be a clear, simple message for Gettard, it has led many to faith and challenged believers to follow Jesus more closely. It's filled with illusions that there's more to the story than meets the eye. Gettard says this first verse is an example of these subtle hints of ambiguity that calls us to go deeper. He says the author of Mark is opening his narrative in the same manner the Hebrew scriptures do. In the beginning, God created. John, Genesis 1.1. See, Mark is announcing a new beginning. The good news begins here, he says. The Greek word for gospel, evangelion, was not used in the same way we use it today. Gospel was not yet a label for a type of literature or meaning Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Mark is saying, this whole story I'm going to tell you is good news. Touching a bit on my title of change is coming. Even though there are lots of sad things in the story, Mark is telling them there's a reason to keep hope, to know that God will provide and we can believe in his promises, that his word is true and will never fail. On the surface, things may look dark, Edward says, but we are asked to look deeper. And he says, Mark is using this phrase as a double meaning purposely. We might take this phrase to mean the arrival of God's reign as proclaimed by Christ, in which Jesus is the proclaimer, and Mark is just preserving the words of the historical Jesus, or Jesus is the proclaimed good news. And thus, Mark's role is to interpret the meaning of this. Gettard says Mark is doing both. He's using it doubly. I'm sure we'll see more of this in, in this intriguing gospel. I love that Gettard writes this, though. Mark is challenging us to respond to the good news, not because just that Jesus came, but also that he's calling still to respond to the gospel of the kingdom. Now, why would Jews be getting baptized anyway, people might say. 
Jews had no need of this historically. But here they were coming from all over, the Gospels tell us. Another sign of change on the horizon. John C. is inviting them to re-enter the covenant of old, to rejoin the people of God. They are to come as repentant sinners and re prepare their hearts for what is to come. Ready or not, change is coming. And we know this new thing will take form with Jesus being baptized and receiving power from the Holy Spirit, which we'll be looking at next week. Which will be Pentecost. That has something to do with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> But as usual, the message here is beginning with the Jews and then will be offered to all and still is for all who will proclaim Christ as king can be filled with the spirit. Thursday and Friday, I attended virtually the new Renew Conference put on every other year by the Church of the Brethren. This year's theme was Disciples Called, Equipped, and in the Neighborhood. I still have about six hours of worship workshops to watch that I missed as you have to pick and choose and thankfully I could go back and do that but I really enjoyed the five I did attend with Ryan Brock which were all sessions under the umbrella in the title escaping the church growth model graveyard Ryan went to seminary at the same time I did and planted a small church about 13 years ago and I've been following him since I began seminary about a decade ago I will no doubt be sharing a lot of what I've heard from him at this, but not at this point. For now, I would like to share with you a bit from our keynote speaker. Pictured here, Jesse Cruikshank, an ordained Foursquare pastor, author, and nationally recognized expert on discipleship, neuroeducation, and experiential education. Her two plenary sessions dealt with barriers to formation for discipleship. She first discussed how the build it and it, they will come days are over and have been for a long time. She said she was glad that it's no longer a question of is change coming. Now the conversation is shifting to how we can adapt to reach people for Christ in a culture that is growing hostile, more hostile towards religion every day. Barriers to discipleship formation began a long time ago, she said. For the first century, most Gentile audiences of Mark and the first Christians for a few hundred years, really there were just three goals of making disciples, community, apprenticeship, and union with God. And then there were a few turns that took us further and further from these goals being central and act as historical barriers still today. First, she said there's a period of constant Constantinople or Constantine, and we could have a class on how this changed Christianity. But I will just mention Jesse's main point, that Constantine professionalized Christianity. Now it's mainly for trained professionals from this time on, and the set-apart ministry term we use for those called to ministry became a physical one. The called were taken from the community to be trained rather than to lead and learn together with the body of faith. And only certain individuals were to receive this training, much like the talking point people have today against free higher education. If everyone became college educated, what would make a graduate special or desired above others? Her next point was that the Enlightenment rationalized discipleship. During this period, much later, during the 16 and 1700s, mystery was disliked. We became obsessed with measuring everything. We began counting people, using stats to define everything, even scripture. As the interpretation of the biblical text, or hermeneutics, began with our Aristotle and Augustine. But I would argue this would be much earlier, really, with the Old Testament, as there's the Mishnah, the Midrash, and the Talmud. Studying and interpreting the Bible is not bad, Jesse says, but an overemphasis on this has unintended consequences 
that still affect us today. It unqualifies people to do the work. It makes it seem like you have to have an MDiv. You have to be college educated to understand the Bible. It adds to a list of disqualifications for what we brethren called the priesthood of all believers. And shortly after the Enlightenment, the Reformation, says Cruikshank, sermonized the discipleship. Now only male educators, good speakers, were seen to be able to proclaim the good news. Then something else occurred, beginning even further, get, brought us even further from these goals. The church in Acts would want us to keep, and I dare say Jesus, the Industrial Revolution. The norm became the goal everyone wanted to achieve. Suburb cookie-cutter homes, the bell curve, teaching us we should all strive to be normal. This, to me, was the beginning of the build it and they will come era. It was also a time of great revival occurring. Most said that they were Christian. The American church took on the role of being a spiritual factory of sorts, though. You put in a prescribed model of discipleship, and you get a Jesus-looking widget disciple. <laughs> I like that term. It really seems true in this period. It probably worked to some extent at this time, for fitting in was necessary to many. Do as others do. Be like the norm. Sunday school began to be a form of discipleship at this time. Every denomination scrambled to create what they considered their pathway to make disciples. This is what most people consider the good old days or the glory days of dis church and discipleship. Things were easy. Pour into people and get back Jesus widgets. Everyone being the same, and if that were true. And so many people focus on us getting back there. But these days are not coming back. It is time for us to face this and find a way to be relevant in the day and time we are in. Instead of looking backward to the glory days that just won't return. In actuality, this really was glory days on the surface, too, we must remember. There's a dark side to this cookie-cutter discipleship model. Times in history where we can see that Christianity was thriving due to colonization, or when scripture was being used to be able to justify slavery. Everyone else is doing it. There's a few scriptures that talk about slaves. It must be okay. Or the exclusion of women in ministry. There was a lot of abuse in the Catholic Church during this time, and still is. But uh, probably most churches really during this time, the norm was silence, right? They covered everything up. There was little accountability for those in power. And everyone is just trying to fit in and be part of a crowd. But what is more than trying to get back to the glory days, which are never coming back, that we rise when we fa fail, that we keep trying to reach others for Christ, that we adapt, overcome, and prevail, one might say. For change is just not, not just coming, it's here. The cookie-cutter form of discipleship, Jesse says, also fails to realize that God is already working in the pe people's lives, talking to everyone every day since they were born. It's not dependent on me or us to act in order for them to be a child of God. We just get the opportunity to walk with them if we're paying attention, curious to see how the Spirit is already active in their lives. But we tend not to truly believe this, so we make up plans. We try to fit them into a pipeline or hierarchy or institution, no matter if it lines up with their needs or not. But God, God needs people where they are. The last major barrier to true discipleship that Jesse named is the caste. In America, we may call it the social class system. In all cultures, we humans automatically create a sorting mechanism 
and still adhere to it in many ways. We see this in schools, also created in a factory-like fashion. Why do we give grades? Because we buy into this notion that some are meant to lead, to be higher, higher in the pecking order, so to speak. This was intentionally put in place by those in power. But we in the church have adopted this paradigm and spiritualized it, Jesse says. We want to sort people, much like grades, to the students. But, student, but scripture says that all are called. Not everyone answers, but God is calling each to be his disciple. Sometimes the most uneducated are really the most obedient to the Lord's calling. Educated people want to question everything and think they can come up with better plans that will work for discipleship than following the, the Spirit. We try to rationalize this obedience thing found in Scripture often. So for Jesse, it's important to acknowledge these historical barriers to discipleship. But we can't see what we don't know exists. These are mental barriers that say you can't be a disciple. You're underqualified. And sometimes leaders even have this, even when they answer the call. These historical barriers are real factors when we come to God to hear and be led by the Holy Spirit to do kingdom work. All of us need, need to be intentional then on hearing, to learn to be still, be diligent in working on our skills of discernment, and we need each other too. We can be comforted, though, that Jesus simplified discipleship making. He meant for it to be what the first Christians focused on, community, apprenticeship, and union with God. He called his disciples into community. He had them learn as he went. And he always was modeling and teaching that close relationship with our creator was the most important thing to be a follower. So to recap this section, we can name and take down barriers. I'm sure you have others specific to you and your experiences. But we need to know that we are all qualified and he will equip us as we go. And our uniqueness is part of our ability to disciple. Your voice will resonate with who you are supposed to reach. I agree with Jesse on that wholeheartedly. She says we cannot disciple a lot of people well. Even those trained in re leadership roles can really only disciple three to five Disciples well, she says. But what if us really took that, uh, if we each took that on? Wouldn't we grow the kingdom amazingly if three, each of us discipled three to five people really well? This is so needed in today's world. How many more people would we get to find this Jesus? This is the kind of Jesus impact I think our God is wanting for us to consider embarking on with the help of the Holy Spirit leading. Even more importantly, though, we need imagination to see what the true meaning of ecclesia or church is today. We're in a season, Jesse says, in two places found in the Bible. At the foot of Mount Sinai, where God is wanting to speak a new word to us. So we need to be ready to hear what the new thing God wants us to hear and to be led towards. We're at a simi simi similar pinnacle found in the Reformation, she says. Oh, isn't that exciting? And we are also in the upper room, or at least we should be, being ready to be touched by the Holy Spirit and led to imagining what it looks like for the church to move forward into the next Jesus season until Jesus returns. What does it mean to be a church family, a community of faith maybe, even without a building? There won't be buildings in heaven, she says. The format and rituals that we have created won't be the same. 
That's all I have from Jesse today. I'll share more of my learning at the conference at another time. Now I just want to look at change for a moment and some great quotes I found. I'll just read one of, out of the two on the ch screen. Here's two from John F. Kennedy. One says, change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. This one's from Phil Crosby. If anything is certain, it is that change is certain. The world we are planning for today will not exist in this form tomorrow. And from Robin Sharma, change is hard at first, messy in the middle, and gorgeous at the end. And there's the serenity prayer. And then I found this one, be the change. That's one of my favorite things, always has been. But this said Proverbs 31, 8 to 9. And of course, we know that Gandhi said that. But so I've looked at Proverbs 31, 8, 9. It says, speak up for those who cannot speak, for the rights of who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor. And they say that means be the change. I think that's interesting. And lastly, we can at least know that God and his word do not change in this ever-changing world. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. As we begin our new series in Mark, we're grateful for forerunners, for the word of your God that stands. We thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you for John the Baptist. May we also pave the way forward for the message of Jesus to spread by finding your path and allowing us to be made disciples and to make disciples and for all the glory to be given to you. Amen. Please stand and sing Beyond a Dying Sun, number 323. <coughs>
let us prepare a way for the Lord. Thank you. 